research the opportunities and challenges brought by advances in AI and related technologies, so as to advise policy to maximize the benefits and minimize the risks from advanced AI. Governance, this key term in our name, refers both descriptively to the ways that the decisions are made about the development and deployment of AI, but also the normative aspiration that those decisions emerge from institutions that are effective, equitable, and legitimate. If you want to learn more about our work, you can go to governance.ai. I am delighted today to introduce our conversation featuring Joseph Stieglitz in discussion with Anton Koren. Professor Stieglitz is university professor at Columbia University. He is also the co-chair of the high-level expert group on the measurement of economic performance and social progress at the OECD and the chief economist of the Roosevelt Institute. A recipient of the Nobel Memorial Prize in Economic Sciences in 2001 and the John Bates Clark Medal in 1979, he is a former senior vice president and chief economist of the World Bank and a former member and chairman of the U.S. President's Council of Economic Advisors. Known for his pioneering work on asymmetric information, Professor Stieglitz's research focuses on income distribution, risk, corporate governance, public policy, macroeconomics, and globalization. Professor Koronek is an associate professor at the University of Virginia, Department of Economics, and Darden School of Business, as well as a research associate at the NBER and a research fellow at the CEPR and a research affiliate at the Center for the Governance of AI. His areas of expertise include macroeconomics, international finance, and inequality. His most recent research investigates the effects of progress in automation and artificial intelligence for macroeconomic dynamics and inequality. Over the next decades, AI will dramatically change the economic landscape. It may also magnify inequality both within and across countries. Anton and Joe will be discussing the relationship between technology and inequality, the potential impact of AI on the global economy, and the economic policy and governments, governance challenges that may arise in an age of transformative AI. We will aim for a conversational format between uh, Professors Anton uh, and uh, Stieglitz, but I also want to encourage all audience members to type your questions using the box below. We can promise that they will be answered, but we will see them and try to integrate them into the conversation. With that, Anton and Joe, we look forward to learning from you and the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Jocelyn, for the kind introduction. Inequality has been growing for decades now and has been further exacerbated by the K-shaped recovery from COVID-19. In some ways, this has catapulted the question of how we can engineer a fairer economy and society to the top of the policy agenda all around the world. And as Jocelyn has emphasized, what is of particular concern for us at the Center for the Governance of AI is that modern technologies and to a growing extent artificial intelligence are often said to play a central role in increasing inequality. And there are concerns that future advances in AI may in fact further turbocharge inequality. So I'm extremely pleased and honored that Joe Stiglitz is joining us for today's GovAI webinar to discuss the theme AI and inequality with us. Joe has made some of the most path-breaking contributions to economics in the 20th century as we have already heard, his work was recognized by the Nobel Prize in Economics in 2001. And I should say that he has also been the formative intellectual force behind my education as an economist. Uh, what I have always really admired in Joe, and I still admire it every time we interact, is that he combines a razor sharp intellect with a big heart and that he's always optimistic about the ability of ideas to improve the world. We will start this webinar with a broader conversation on emerging technologies and inequality. And over the course of the webinar, we will move more and more towards AI and ultimately the potential for transformative AI 
to reshape our economy and our society. So let me welcome you again, Joe, and let's perhaps start uh, with uh, the following question. Uh, can you explain what we mean by inequality and what are the dimensions of inequality that we should be most concerned about? The disparities in the circumstances uh, uh, of individuals, uh, uh, one is always going to have uh, some disparities, uh, but not of the magnitude and not of the multiplicity of dimensions. So when economists talk about inequality, they first talk about inequalities of income, wealth, labor income, other sources of income. And uh, both of those have grown enormously over the last 40 years. Uh, maybe I should point out that uh, in the mid 50s, uh, Simon Kuznets was a great economist, uh, got a Nobel Prize. Uh, had thought that in the early stages of development, inequality would increase, but then it would decrease. And the historical record was not inconsistent with that at the time he was writing. But then beginning in the mid-1970s, beginning of the 1980s, it started to soar. And uh, it has continued to increase uh, uh, until today. And the, the pandemic has emphasized the K-shaped recovery where, where it's even uh, being ex uh, exposed and exacerbated by COVID-19. Now, beyond that, uh, there are many other dimensions of inequality. Um, access to health, especially in countries like the United States where you don't have a national health service uh, and uh, U.S has, as a result, the largest disparities in health among the advanced countries, and uh, even before 2019, an average decline in life expectancy and overall health standards. Um, there are disparities in access to justice, uh, other dimensions that make for a decent life. Um, one of the concerns that has been highlighted in the last year is uh, the extent to which th those disparities are associated with race and gender. And uh, that has given rise to this huge Black Lives Matter. Uh, but we've, we've seen, it, it just reminded us of things that we, we knew but were not uh, always conscious of is the, these tremendous uh, inequalities across different groups in our society. Uh, thank you, Joe. Can you tell us uh, perhaps a bit more about what motivated you personally to dedicate so much of your work to inequality in recent decades? I've heard you speak of your experience growing up in Gary, Indiana, and I have heard a lot about your role as a policymaker as a chair of the President's Council of Economic Advisors and as a chief economist of the World Bank in the 1990s. How has all of this shaped your thinking on inequality? Well, I, I grew up, as you said, in, in Gary, Indiana, which was uh, emblematic of industrial America. Uh, and, uh, you know, of course, when I was growing up, I didn't realize, re realize that. I just looked at what was my surroundings and uh, I saw enormous inequalities and inequalities, not only in income, as I say, but across race discrimination. Uh, that was really hard to, to uh, reconcile with uh, what I was being taught about America's America dream. Everybody has the same opportunity. Uh, this, uh, 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 all people are created equal. All those uh, things that we were told about America, uh, and which I believed at one level, seemed inconsistent with what my eyes were saying at the other. And that was why I, I had planned, uh, maybe it seems strange, but I wanted to be a theoretical physicist 
and the 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 problems that I had seen growing up in, on inequality, uh, suddenly at the end of my third year in college, I said, you know, that's what what I wanted to devote my life to was understanding and doing something about inequality. So I entered ec economics with that very much on my mind. And it's what I wrote my thesis on, uh, inequality. But uh, life takes its turn and, and, and much of the time in between then and, and uh, beginning about 10 years ago was spent on uh, issues of, of uh, imperfect information, imperfect markets, related in some sense to inequalities because uh, in some sense, the inequalities in access to information were very much at the core at, of some of the inequalities in our society. Uh, inequalities in education played a very important role in perpetuation of inequalities. So the two were not totally des disparate <laughs> agenda. And, and then I also, um, from the very beginning, uh, spent a lot of time thinking about development. And that interacted with my uh, other work on theoretical uh, economics. It may seem strange, but I did go to Africa in, uh, begin in 1969 uh, to Kenya, right not long after it got its independence. And, um, you know, I'm almost proud to say that, that some people in Africa claim me to be the first African uh, Nobel Prize winner. Uh, in the sense that I, 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 I've given, so it has such an important role in shaping my own research. So, um, uh, so that, that strand of, of thinking about inequality uh, between the developing countries and the uh, developed countries was also very important. And then finally, in terms of your question, when I was uh, in the uh, Clinton administration, uh, we, we had a lot of, you might say, fights about inequality. Everybody was concerned about inequality, but some were more concerned than others. Some wanted to put it at the top of the agenda and some said we should worry about it, but we don't have the money to deal with it. <laughs> so it was it was a question of prioritization. So on one hand, on one side, Bob Reich and I, uh, Bob Reich was the Secretary of Labor, were were very much concerned about this inequality. Uh, we were concerned about corporate welfare giving benefits to rich corporations meant that we had less money to help those who really needed it. And our war against corporate welfare uh, at some points uh, led to actually an internal, huge internal conflict between us and some of the more, you might call, corporatist or financial members of the Clinton team. Hmm. So that so brings us uh, perhaps, perhaps directly, directly to a more, a more philosophical, philosophical question. Uh, what would you say is the ethical case for inequality? And in particular, why should we care about inequality in itself and not just about absolute levels of income and wealth? Well, the latter it, you can answer easier from an economic point of view. There is now uh, a considerable body of theory and empirical evidence that uh, societies that are marked by large disparities, large inequalities, behave differently and overall perform more poorly than societies with less inequalities. Uh, we sometimes uh, use the term, your own work uh, has highlighted this term, macroeconomic externalities. And the, the way the system works is adversely affected by the presence of inequality. Um, an example 
uh, for instance, is that when there are a lot of inequalities, those at the bottom engage in keeping up with the Joneses, as we say, uh, and that leads them to more in debt. And that higher level of debt introduces a kind of financial fragility to the economy, makes it more prone to economic downturns. But there are a number of other channels through which economic inequality um, adversely affects uh, macroeconomic, overall economic uh, performance. So much so that the argument can be made that uh, even those at the top can be worse off if there's too much inequality. And this view uh, that I reflected in my book, where that book that I call The Price of Inequality, where I said that we, our society, our economy, pays a high price for inequality, um, uh, has moved into the mainstream, which is why the IMF has put the concerns about inequality really at the fore at their agenda. And as Strauss Kahn, who was the director of the IMF at the time this happened, about a decade ago, said, this is an issue uh, of concern to the IMF because the IMF is concerned about macroeconomic stability and growth. And this is, the evidence is overwhelming that it does affect macroeconomic performance and growth. Um, the, uh, the moral issue, uh, uh, economists are perhaps less uh, well qualified to talk about that rigorously, but the kinds of models that e eco uh, economists, philosophers have used, uh, utilitarian, uh, uh, e e equality preferring social welfare functions, uh, a whole uh, literature of which uh, Rawls is an example, uh, argues that uh, provides a, a philosophical basis why uh, behind the veil of ignorance, you would prefer to be born into a society with uh, greater equality. Mm -hmm. So that means there's both a moral and an economic efficiency reason to engage in measures that mitigate inequality. Now, this brings us to a broader debate. What are the drivers of inequality? Is inequality driven by technology or by institutions, uh, policies uh, broadly defined? So there is sometimes uh, this neoclassical caricature of the free market as a natural state uh, of the world. And in this uh, caricature description of the world, it's all about technology and technologies kind of naturally give rise to inequality and everything we would do about it in this type of caricature uh, would be bad for economic efficiency. Uh, can you explain the interplay of uh, technology and institutions a little bit more broadly, and maybe tell us what's wrong about this caricature. So another way of putting it, it <clears throat> is inequality the result of the laws of nature or the laws of man? And I'm very much of the view that it's a result overwhelmingly of the laws of man, uh, of the institutions, um, one way of thinking about that, uh, and I think compelling evidence for my perspective, is that the laws of nature are universal. Uh, globalization, technology applies to every country. Yet when we see the outcomes in different countries, we see very markedly different levels of inequality, different levels in market income and in different levels of inequality, even more so in uh, after tax and transfer incomes. So it is clear that the uh, countries that should be relatively similar have been shaped in a different way by the laws. And what are some of those laws? Well, um, some of them are, are pretty obvious. Uh, if you have uh, 
labor laws that undermine the ability of workers to engage in collective bargaining, workers are going to get the short shaft. Uh, they're going to have to not be treated well. And you see that in the United States. That's one of the, the main things that has contributed to the weakening of uh, the share of labor in the United States, I believe, is the weakening of labor laws and the po power to unionize. Uh, at the other extreme, if you have more corporate market power, monopolies mm -hmm. can raise prices, and raising prices is equivalent to lowering wages. <laughs> you care about what you can purchase. And uh, the proceeds of that goes to those who own the monopolists who are monopolies who are disproportionately those at the top. We saw during COVID-19, Jeff Bezos do a fantastic job making billions of dollars where the bottom 40% of Americans suffered a, a great deal. So uh, the laws governing antitrust competition policy are critical. But it's actually a host of other details of the institutional arrangements that we sometimes don't notice. Uh, I'll talk about the United States, but because it illustrates we do things so much worse than other <laughs> in many of these ways. Uh, <clears throat> bankruptcy laws, uh, <clears throat> which give first priority, uh, bankruptcy laws deal with what happens if you have uh, a, a, a debtor can't pay all the money uh, in the United States. First claimant are the banks who've issued derivatives those fin risky products that led to the financial crisis of 2008. On the other hand, if you borrow money to get ahead in life to finance education, you cannot discharge your debt. So students are at the bottom and the banks are at the top. <laughs> so that's another example. Corporate governance laws that give the CEO's enormous scope for setting their salaries any way they want, resulting in the United States, uh, the CEO is getting 300 times the wages in compensation of our average workers. Uh, that's another uh, example. But there are a whole host of things that we often don't even think of as institutions, but really are. Uh, <clears throat> When we make public investments, infrastructure, do we provide for public transportation systems, which are very important for poor people? When we have public transportation systems, do we connect poor people with jobs? And in, in Washington, D.C., they made a deliberate effort not to do that. When we're running monetary policy, are we focusing on making sure that there is close to full employment as possible? which increases workers' bargaining power, or do we focus on inflation, which might be bad for bondholders? And so the conduct of monetary policy in the aftermath of the 2008 crisis, we led to unprecedented wealth inequality, but didn't succeed very well in creating jobs. 91% of the gains that occurred in the first three years of recovery went to to the top 1% in the United States. So it's, it's an amalgam of an enormous number of decisions. Now, even when you come to the issue of technology, which you said, you know, the laws of nature, we forget the laws of nature are man-made to a large extent. No, it's not change <laughs> the law, quantum mechanics, but technology, where we direct our attention is man-made. And how the extent to which we make access to technology available for all is a social decision. So whether we steer technology to save the planet or to save unskilled jobs, will determine whether we're going to have a high level of unemployment of low-skilled people or whether we're going to have a healthier planet. <laughs> whether we, our rules, you know, we, we, fantastic success in developing quickly vaccines against COVID-19. But now the big debate is, 
should those vaccines be available only to rich countries or should we waive the intellectual property rights in order to allow poor countries to produce these vaccines? That's an issue being discussed right now mm-hmm. at the WTO. And unfortunately, you know, 100 countries want a waiver. But US and a few European countries say no. We put the profits of our drug companies over the lives, not only of the movers in the developing countries, but possibly over the lives of the people in our own country, because as long as the disease rages, a mutation may come that is uh, 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 vaccine resistant and our own lives are at risk. So, you know, it's very clear that's a battle of institutions. And right now, unfortunately, the drug companies are winning. Mm -hmm. It's a battle of institutions within the realm of a new technology. So if we now turn to another new technology, AI, Um, You hear a lot of concern about AI increasing inequality. Uh, What are the potential channels uh, that you see that we should be concerned about? And uh, perhaps to what extent uh, could AI be different from other new technologies when it comes to the impact on inequality? Well, you know, AI is often lumped together with with other kinds of innovations and people look historically and they say, look at uh, innovations are always going to be disturbing, uh, but uh, over the long run, uh, ordinary people gain. Yes, uh, the makers of buggy whips lost out when we came, the automobile came along, but the number of new jobs created in auto repair far exceeded the old jobs and overall uh, workers were better off. In fact, it created the wonderful era of the the middle class era of the 20th, mid 20th century. Well, I think this time may be different. There's every reason to believe that it is different for a whole variety uh, of reasons. Um, the, the, the first uh, is that um, the new technologies are, to a greater extent, labor replacing, labor saving, than increasing the in productivity of labor. And so they're substituting for labor, and that drives down the wages. Um, so there's no a priori theory that says any innovation should be of one form or the other. We know that could be one form or the other. Historically, they were more labor augmenting, labor enhancing, uh, intelligence assisting innovations rather than labor replacing. But the evidence now is that they may be more labor replacing. Secondly, the new technologies have a winner-take-all kind of characteristic associated with them. They have augmented the potential of monopoly power. And so both of these characteristics mean that there will be uh, a less competitive market, uh, 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 greater inequality resulting from this increased market power from which everybody, uh, almost everybody, uh, may may lose. In the case of developing countries, um, the problems are even more severe for two reasons. Uh, the first is that the strategy that has worked so well to close the gap between the developing and the developed country, which was export manufacturing export led growth, may be coming to an end. The reason is that globally, employment and manufacturing is declining. And uh, the even if all the jobs in manufacturing shifted, say, from China to Africa, it would make just a dent in the increase in uh, labor force in Africa. So uh, 
I and some others have been trying to understand why was manufacturing export-led growth so successful? And what can countries do today that if that strategy doesn't work, are there other strategies that will? And the conclusion is, yes, there are things that work, but they're going to be much more difficult. And there won't likely be the kind of success that East Asia had beginning, say, uh, 50 years ago. The second point is that when we talk about AI and the inequalities to which it can give rise, when they occur within our country, when Jeff Bezos is richer or uh, Bill Gates is richer, uh, we always have the potential to tax the gainers and redistribute some of their gains to the losers. And there's a general term that uh, uh, you and I wrote about in one of our papers showing that for a wide class of cases that uh, we can, in fact, make sure that with that redistributive tax and taxation, everybody could be better off. Not necessarily that they will, because that's a matter of politics and that's in another realm, but at least in principle, everybody could be made better off. When you have this kind of innovation going uh, across countries, the main asset of many developing countries, unskilled labor, certain natural resources, the value of those assets is going to go down. And that means they're going to be worse off. And our international arrangements for redistribution uh, just aren't there. And in fact, things are worse than that. Uh, our trade uh, uh, agreements, our tax provisions, international, actually work to the disadvantage of the developing countries. So we don't have the instruments to engage in the redistributions and the current instruments actually work to uh, the uh, disfavor of the developing countries. Mm -hmm. So let me turn to a somewhat more longer term question now. Uh, many technologists predict that AI will have the potential to be really transformative if it reaches the ability to perform substantially everything that human workers can do. This is sometimes labeled transformative AI, but people have also used closely related concepts like artificial general intelligence, uh, human level machine intelligence. Uh, and there are quite a few AI experts who predict that such transformative advances in AI may happen within the next few decades already. Uh, this could lead to a revolution that's of similar or greater magnitude as the agrarian or industrial revolution. And it could make all human labor redundant, uh, make it, uh, in economic speak, a dominated technology. Um, so speaking of inequality, the dilemma is, of course, that in our present world, labor is the main source of income. So uh, let me be, perhaps first start. Are you willing to speculate as a social scientist, not as a technologist, on the likelihood and time frame of transformative AI happening? And what do you see as the main reasons why it may not be happening soon? Uh, or what would be the main arguments in favor of transformative AI happening soon? And um, should we think about the potential impacts of transformative AI in your perspective? Well, uh, uh, there, there is a famous quip by uh, Yogi Berra, who is uh, viewed as uh, one of the uh, great thinkers of America. Uh, I'm not sure everybody in, in the UK knows about it. He, he was a famous baseball player who had uh, uh, simple... Uh, uh, perspectives of life. And one of them was uh, forecasting is really difficult, especially of the future. Uh, uh, 
the point is that uh, we don't know, uh, but we certainly could contemplate uh, this happening. Uh, and it's not to think about uh, that possibility. Uh, so, um, as social scientists, uh, we ought to be thinking about uh, all of the possible contingencies, but obviously devote more of our work to those that are going to be most stressful for our society. Uh, you know, uh, you don't think that people should train to be a doctor to deal just with colds. Uh, you, you want your doctor to be able to respond to serious maladies. And what you've just described, I, want to, I don't want to call it a malady, it could be a great thing, but it's certainly a, a transformative moment that would put very large stresses in our economic, social, political system. The important point, I think, is to go back to um, the, the general philosophy that I've been trying to discuss, is that the, these advances in technologies make our society as a whole wealthier. Uh, it moves out what we could do. In principle, everyone could be made better off. So the question is, can we undertake the social, economic, political arrangements to ensure that everyone will be better off or a vast majority. But we, when you're doing that sort of speculative reasoning that you're encouraging, you can also see a few people uh, controlling the technologies and our society entering into a new era of unprecedented inequality with a few people having all the wealth and, and uh, everybody else just struggling to get along, becoming really serfs, a new kind of serfdom, uh, a 21st century, 22nd century serfdom uh, that uh, uh, different from that of, of the 13th and 12th century but for the vast majority, uh, not a good thing. Mm -hmm. So for the next few questions that I'm going to ask you, for the sake of the argument, let's take it as a given that uh, this type of transformative AI will arrive by, say, 2100. Uh, what would you expect would be the effects of that on economic growth? and on the labor share, and also in particular on inequality. And um, perhaps what would be the effects on inequality in non-pecuniary, non-monetary terms? So the, the effect on, on inequality in income and wealth and monetary aspects will depend critically on the institutions that we described earlier in two key intellectual property. Uh, if we have wide access to intellectual property in a meaningful way, uh, and there are many ways besides patents in which you could hoard knowledge, but uh, if you have widespread access to knowledge, then competition is going to lower prices and, and uh, the benefits of that will become widely shared. That was the historic experience in the 19th and 20th century. Eventually, competition got ideas out into the marketplace. Profits got eroded eventually. Uh, the early year, years of the Industrial Revolution were not great for ordinary workers, but eventually they did benefit, and competition did serve to make sure that the benefit of the advances in technology were widely shared. Say, there's a concern about whether our legal and institutional framework can ensure that that will happen with, uh, with, with artificial intelligence. So 
That's one aspect of the institutional structure. Even if we fail to do the right thing in that area, we have another set of instruments, which are redistributive taxes. We, we could tax uh, uh, Jeff Bezos or Bill Gates or you know, the, the billionaires, the multi-billionaires. Um, from the point of view of incentives, most economists would agree that uh, if uh, these were rewarded with rather than 160 billion, they got 16 billion, would they work hard? Probably yes. <laughs> Evidence that they say, oh, I'm gonna take my marbles and not play with you anymore. Uh, they, they, you know, uh, these are creative people who, who wanna be at the top but you can be at the top with 16 rather than 160 billion. If you take that money and use it in a way that you have more shared prosperity, then obviously the nature of our society would be markedly different. And if we think about it more broadly right now, uh, President Biden is talking a lot about the caring economy. Uh, a lot of jobs are being created in uh, education, health, caring for the aged, caring for the sick. Wages in those jobs are relatively low because of the legacy of discrimination against women and people of color who've been in that area. And, you know, our, our society has been willing to take advantage of that history of discrimination and pay them low wages. Well, if we said, you know, why do that? Why not, let, why not let the wages reflect our values of how important it is to care for these parts of our society? So you tax the very top and you use that to create the new jobs for uh, decent paid jobs, uh, then you would have, a, again, a very, very different outcome. So. Uh, on the optimistic side, I think this new era could work out for creating a kind of shared prosperity, still have some inequality, but not the nightmare scenario of the new serfdom that I talked about uh, before. Mm -hmm. um, so let's perhaps uh, turn to economic policy a bit more. You have already foreshadowed uh, uh, a number of interesting points on this uh, theme, uh, but let's maybe talk about economic policy to combat inequality more generally. So if I uh, want to take a step back, people often refer to redistribution on the one hand and pre-distribution, on the other hand, as the main categories of economic policies to combat inequality. Can you explain what these two mean? Uh, what are the main instruments of redistribution, of pre-distribution, and how do they relate to our discussion on inequality? So pre-distribution is just uh, saying that uh, what are the... Um, factors that determine the distribution of market income. And if we can create a more equal distribution of market income, then we have to less burden put on redistribution to create a, a fair society. So there are two factors in turn that go into the market distribution of income. One, the distribution of the ownership of assets, and the second, the fact what you pay each of those assets. So taking each of those in turn, I refer to, for instance, if you have a lot of market power and weak labor power, you wind up with capital getting a high return relative to workers, monopoly profits, doing well relative to workers. So that's an example of, of uh, uh, the exercise of market power leading to greater inequality. And that's why part of the progressive agenda 
in the United States puts a lot of emphasis on better la- uh, unionization, increasing the power of unions, and curbing the power of the big tech giants. So that that's creating uh, uh, factor prices that are more conducive to uh, more market equality. Hmm. Second is the ownership of assets. And here are there two. Um, uh, human capital and financial capital. And uh, the general issue here is how do we prevent the intergenerational transmission of advantage and disadvantage? And, you know, throughout the ages, there's always been uh, parents want to help their children. That's not an issue. Uh, the question is the magnitude of that. So um, in the United States, for instance, uh, we have uh, a education system which is very local based, where we've had more and more economic segregation, which means rich people live with rich and poor with poor. If you live with rich and you live, the schools in those neighborhoods give those kids a really good education and conversely in the others. So even when we have public education, there is this inequal, uh, uh, perpetuation of inequality. And then the most important um, provision in the intergenerational transmission of financial wealth, of course, is the inheritance tax and more generally capital taxation. And we basically, under Trump, they eviscerated the inheritance taxes. And uh, so the question is uh, uh, how to bring that back in, uh, you know, uh, and, and that becomes then a, 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 another pillar of uh, trying to create a more equal market distribution called pre-distribution. Mm-hmm. Um, so you have started to bring up the question of taxation in the context of estate taxation. And I should uh, emphasize for the non-economists uh, in the room uh, that among the many contributions that Joe has made to economics is a 1976 textbook with Tony Atkinson that is frequently referred to as the Bible of public finance, in which they lay out the basic theory of taxation as it still underlies basically all theoretical work in economics on taxes. So um, in, in recent decades, the main focus of this debate has been on should we tax labor versus capital? And a lot of economists argue that we should not tax capital because it's self-defeating. It will just discourage the accumulation of capital and ultimately hurt workers. Uh, My question to you is, do you agree or what's wrong with this standard argument? Argument. Well, uh, it it, it is an argument that one has to treat seriously. Um, That is that uh, a tax on capital could lead to less capital accumulation, which would in turn lead to lower wages. And even if the proceeds of the tax were redistributed to workers, workers could be worse off. And you can write down theoretical models in which that happens. The problem is that's not the world we live in. (laughs) That in fact, you have other instruments at your disposal. So that, for instance, as the government is taxing capital, it can invest in public capital, it can invest in education and infrastructure, and the returns on those are so high that wages actually can go up. So workers can be doubly benefited, not only from the direct distribution, but because allocating more capital to education and infrastructure can lead to more 
equality of market income. Um, many of the earlier theories were predicated on the uh, assumption that somehow we were able to tax away all of the rents, all of the pure profits. And we know that's not true. I mean, the corporate profit tax right now is 21% in the United States. Uh, you just see the amount of, of uh, wealth that the people at the top are accumulating. You know that you're not taxing away all of those pure profits. And uh, that really illustrates the point that I'm making. Taxing that away would not lead to less capital accumulation. In fact, could lead to more capital uh, accumulation. If you look more broadly at what has happened, uh, the nature of capitalism in the 20, late 20th and early 21st century, we used to talk about the financial sector intermediating, that meant bringing between households and firms, bringing savings into corporations, helping savings, helping capital accumulation. The evidence is for the last 30 years, 40 years, the financial sector has been disintermediating. The main financial sector has been taking these monopoly profits and not investing them, but redistributing them to the consumption of the very wealthy or to increasing the value of their assets and land or other uh, 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 assets around the world. So the point uh, is that th that particular simple model uh, doesn't describe 20th, 21st century capitalism. So should we think of AI as capital in the sense of what we use in our theories of capital taxation in economics or is AI somehow inherently different? Should we impose something like uh, what Bill Gates called a robot tax? Well, that's a really good question. And let me, I, I should have, you know, if I had more time, I would, would have uh, distinguished between uh, intangible capital, as they call R&D, and buildings and equipment. 21st century capital is mostly intangible capital. It is the result of investment in R&D. Uh, it is uh, more productive <laughs> in many ways than buildings. Uh, but it is real capital in that sense. The, the, uh, and I think the word intangible is a better way of describing its ideas. Uh, uh, so, uh, um, but it is a result of investment. People make decisions to hire workers, to, to have them think about these issues, or individuals decide themselves to think about these issues when they could have done something else. So it is capital in that sense. It's foregone uh, uh, what you, uh, resources that could have been put to other uses and are thinking about future-oriented returns. So it, 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 it is capital. And the question is, is that capital getting excess returns? And um, the, are there social consequences of those investments that those who make those investments don't take into account. And that's it, what we call externalities. People who invest in coal-fired power plants may make a lot of money, but it destroys the planet. And we say that's an example where there are costs to society bears that if we don't have a tax on carbon, the investor doesn't bear. Well, the notion that Gates talking about a robot tax is really based on the same thing. If we replace workers and they go on to the unemployment role, we as a society bear the cost of that unemployment. 
And what you're saying is we ought to think about those costs. How we balance it um, is another matter. How we appropriate the excess returns and how we use that is another question. But clearly, this is an example of steering innovation, another topic that you and I have worked on, that uh, we want to steer innovation to save the planet, not to create more unemployment. So how would you recommend that we should reform our present system of taxation to be ready for uh, the, not only the 21st century, uh, the parts that we live in now, but also potentially a future in which human labor plays less of a role? How should we tax to make sure that we can still uh, support an equitable society? Well, let me just first emphasize that it's not just taxation that's important. Uh, it's investment. Uh, a lot of where the economy is going is a function of basic research, decisions of the National Science Foundation and science foundations in other countries about how to allocate basic research. Uh, and that shapes the evolution of technology that's accessible to those in the private sector. Um, monetary policy, we don't think of, of what the central bank does as affecting innovation, but it does. If you have zero interest rate, the cost of capital is going to be low relative to the cost of labor. And that's going to encourage investors to think about saving labor rather than saving capital. So monetary policy is partly to blame for distortions in the direction of innovation. But as you say, the most important thing is to be sensitive in every aspect of the policy, including tax policy, of how it helps shape our innovative efforts, what we are devoting our research to. Are we devoting our research to saving unskilled labor, to augmenting the power of labor. We talked before about rather than artificial intelligence, intelligence assisting innovations, microscopes and telescopes increased the power of the eye, made us strong, uh, more productive as human beings. So we can replace labor, we can make labor more productive. And um, whether there are, uh, you know, all research is, you might say it's hard, hard to specify what it means exactly to do that, but it's very clear that we have tools that make us think about uh, the various forms of innovation that we might have. Hmm. So if I may switch a little bit to the expenditure side, uh, one policy solution that uh, a lot of technologists are big fans of is a universal basic income. What is your perspective on the UBI? Uh, do you advocate it? Do you believe there are other types of expenditure policy that are more desirable? Uh, do you think it may be a good solution if we arrive at this far future or maybe not so far future in which labor will be displaced? Be displaced. Well, for the next 30, 40 years, uh, I am uh, quite against the UBI. And the reason is very simple. Uh, for the next 30 years, the major challenge of our society is the green transition. And that's going to take a lot of resources, a lot of labor. And uh, uh, some people say, can we afford it? Uh, well, if we have the resources, we have the labor, we have the capital, uh, yes, we can. It's a question of redirecting those resources. Uh, ben Bernanke talked about there being a surplus of capital, uh, a savings glut. Uh, as I look at the challenges facing the world, that was nonsense. The question was, our financial system wasn't addressing the problems that our society needs, which is the green transition. I also see deficiencies in infrastructure, in education, in so many parts of the world. 
So I see huge needs for investments over the next 30, 40 years, enough that we will keep everybody who wants a job uh, full employment. And that's what should be our responsibility. Everybody who wants a job should be able to get one. And we have to have policies to make sure that they are decently paid. So uh, that's our objective. Now, in your uh, far out future, where labor is not needed, everybody, we have the infrastructure that we need, we've made the green transition, um, uh, and we just have these wonderful robots producing other robots, producing all the goods, all the food, all the services that we need. Well, then I, obviously we're going to have to consider uh, who's going to, you know, uh, 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 we will have to consider the UBI. We will still be engaged in a discussion of what makes life meaningful. And uh, work has been part of that story of meaningfulness, but there are ways of, you might say, serving other people that don't have to be monetized, that can be very, very meaningful. So uh, uh, that I'm willing to, to uh, say, uh, begin to speculate, uh, but that's a long way off and, and uh, well after my, uh, my time here on this earth. Uh, would you be willing to revise your timelines if progress in AI occurs faster than what we are currently anticipating? Currently anticipating. Um, as I say, I cannot see the next 30 or 40 years, uh, even if it proceeded very rapidly, given the needs that we have in public investment, in the green transition, uh, being in the state where we uh, uh, will uh, have excess labor and capital. Um, you know, it could happen, we could have miracles, but I, I think that uh, is, is a, a, uh, if that happens, I, th I think we'll find, uh, we can face that emergency uh, of, of this unintended mana from heaven. Uh, I think we'll, we'll, we'll step up to that emergency. Hmm. Um, so uh, we are already towards the end of our uh, regular time slot. Let me ask you, one more question, and then I would like to uh, bring in a few questions posed by the audience. Uh, so my question is, uh, what are the other dimensions of AI that matter for inequality independent of the purely economic questions? And what are your perspectives on those? How can we combat them? Uh I'm not sh quite sure what you mean. I, I suspect, I, you know, that for instance, um, one of the things that we've been talking about is uh, meaning in life, the meaningful work. And if AI takes away work, uh, we will have to find uh, meaning uh, in other places. Um, in the shorter uh, term, um, the uh, AI... Um, will take away, uh, be much more effective in taking away uh, uh, routine jobs. And that will mean that we as a society will be able to devote more labor to non-routine jobs. That should open up possibilities of more creativity. So in that sense that we've always, you know, many people have thought of the flourishing of our society is based on creativity. If we can devote more, re more of our uh, talents to doing non-routine things, creative things, that should be great for our society. Uh, one of the questions in, in the one list of questions, questions the by list the questions audience uh, by was the on audience. workplace surveillance. Uh, and I suppose that's one of those elements of where AI can uh, potentially greatly 
uh, reduce, let's say, the well-being of workers. Uh, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I, I agree. There are many aspects we haven't talked about of uh, uh, adverse effects from AI, um, especially when uh, the, at this early stage where we have inadequate regulation of AI, that uh, it can ha there are a whole set of societal harms that can come from it. So for instance, um, surveillance is, is one. Uh, economists talk about the ability to acquire information that uh, by corporations that enable corporations to appropriate for themselves more of what we call this consumer surplus. In other words, to gauge in discriminatory pricing. Anybody who wants to buy an airline ticket knows what I'm talking about, where they are able to judge whether you really want to go or not. Uh, but they, the companies are using AI now to try to, to charge different prices for different people by judging how much you want the good. The basis of the efficiency of the market economy was everybody pays just the same price. In the new world of uh, uh, Amazon or uh, uh, the internet with AI, everybody has a different price. And uh, that discrimination uh, is very invidious and, and has a, a, a racial and gender component, location component. Uh, there are other aspects of um, uh, adverse aspects of that kind of, you, you might say, uh, 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 individual particular information targeting, uh, one of which is manipulation. They can help manipulate, you know, the, the story that people worry about. Uh, if somebody, uh, they can sense whether somebody uh, has a predilection to be a gambler and encourage you the, the worst attributes and get him to gamble. Uh, the, there are, they can target misinformation, somebody who is more likely to be a anti-vax, uh, give him the information about that reinforces that. And uh, the extent to which that has already been used for political manipulation and political manipulation then becomes really important because remember, I've emphasized the importance of institutions. The institutions and the rules of the game are set by a political process. If you can manipulate that political process, you manipulate our whole economic system. So uh, in the absence of guide rails, uh, guardrails, uh, in the absence of of good rules and regulations, uh, AI can be extraordinarily dangerous for our society. Mm -hmm. um, that um, relates closely that to another question uh, by the audience. Do you think there is a self-correcting force within uh, democracy uh, against high inequality? And I suppose in particular in the context of AI and the inequality that it may uh, lead to. I, I wish I felt convinced that there were a self-correcting force. I also see a force that goes in the other direction. Um, and maybe this is uh, my experience as an American where a high level of inequality has been resulted in uh, distortions, money having a role in the political system, which has changed the rules of the political and economic system to allow money to have more power in both the political system and economic system, reinforcing the creation of that kind of plutocracy that I talked about. And what we've seen in the last few years in the United States, too many of us, uh, is both shocking, but in some ways is what I predicted in my 2010 book on the price of inequality. That uh, 
the Republican Party has openly said, we don't believe in democracy. Uh, that we want to suppress voters, the rights of individuals to vote, make it more difficult for, for them to vote uh, without any evidence that there's been any any mis, uh, 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 voter fraud. It's almost blatant supp voter suppression. And uh, it was what, in some sense, Nancy McLean in her book, Putting Democracy in Chains, talked about, uh, but it's come faster. So to me, I've, I've, I've become uh, concerned that what many would have hoped would be a self-correcting mechanism isn't working. Now, many of us are hoping that we are at a moment where we can turn back the tide that as more and more Americans see that extremes of inequality, they will turn out to vote before it's too late, before they lose the right to vote. And that will be a, you know, a watershed moment in which uh, we will go in a different direction. But I got to say, I feel like we're at the, really at the precipice and I feel I, I'm want, willing to bet uh, that we're going to go the right way, but it's uh, uh, just over 50% odds that I would give it. Well, I think fortunately Joe and all his work on the topic is part of the self-correcting force. Now, uh, the top question in terms of all the votes that uh, people uh, have made in the Q&A box is whether AI will be a driver for long-run convergence or divergence in global inequalities, and whether you believe that uh, the current laggards of uh, poorer countries will be able to catch up with the frontrunners more easily or perhaps less easily. Yeah, I'm afraid that I think that we may be at the end of the era of convergence that we saw over the last 50 years. Uh, th there was wise, you know, widespread convergence, China, India, the disparities. You know, some countries in Africa did not converge, uh, but, but that broadly we saw a, a convergence uh, going on. Um, for the reasons that I gave earlier, I think there is a great risk of divergence. Uh, that is to say that AI is going to decrease the value of the main assets of poor countries, unskilled labor, many natural resources. It'll be a complicated pattern. Uh, the oil countries will find the oil isn't worth very as much if we make the green transition. Those few countries like Bolivia that have large deposits of lithium are gonna find that they're, they're, they're better off, but that's gonna be more the exception than the rule. And um, the access to the technology may be more restrict, of, of the AI may be more difficult. Um, one of the reasons why it's more difficult is that a uh, large, larger fraction of the research is going on inside the corporations than, and, and is not, uh, you know, the, the model of a lot innovation in many areas is, was universities were at the center, you would get a patent, the patent has a disclosure, so that disclosure means that information is a public, uh, others build on that, and um, the, AI, in the way that it's been going so far, uh, it's been, uh, the companies have been better able to hoard that information, but not completely. Obviously, the, the, the underlying mathematical theorems are out in the public domain and uh, others may get access to them. So I think that's still an open question, but I worry that in fact that we will be seeing an era of divergence. Thank you so much, Joe, for sharing your thoughts on AI and inequality with us. Uh, we are almost at time for our event. 
And I was wondering if I may ask you a kind of parting question. Uh, and in fact, a question that comes in two parts. Um, what would be your message to, on the one hand, young AI engineers, and on the other hand, young social scientists, young economists uh, who are uh, beginning their careers or who have recently started their careers and who are interested in contributing to make the world a better and more equitable place? Well, I, I mean, obviously, part of the uh, issue is um, the they the engineers are working for companies, and uh, uh, companies consist of people. And the most important ingredient, I mean, factor in the production of these companies are the talented people. And in the end, uh, the voice of those workers is going to be very important. And so saying it's very important that we conduct ourselves in ways that mitigate the extent to which we contribute to the increase in inequality. Um, an example is uh, there are many people understandably within the, the um, Facebook, the other tech giants that are using all their talents to uh, increase the profits of say Facebook, regardless of the social consequences, regardless of whether it results in a genocide in Myanmar. Uh, you know, uh, that, those are, are decisions that people make. These things just don't happen. Uh, and one has the, at the beginning, um, just to give another example, and I, you know, I, I go to, uh, often to a conference out in Silicon Valley uh, where these issues are, are discussed. Um, and in the beginning of a lot of those discussions, they said, uh, there are no way that we can uh, actually tell whether our algorithms are engaging discrimination. Well, I think the evidence is overwhelmingly is, yes, the algorithms are always changing, they're taking new information, they're evolving, but at any moment of time, you can assess precisely whether they're engaging in discrimination. And uh, there are groups that are now at great cost of trying to to uh, see who is getting what ads and, you know, that you, you can create sampling spaces to see how they're working. So this nihilistic that we owe, it's beyond our bill, we created this monster and don't ask us to control it, I think that's irresponsible. So I think what I'm saying is that those who go to work for these companies need to take a sense of responsibility. What these companies do is a consequence of the actions of the workers in these companies. And one has a moral position that working for these companies, uh, one has to take account, take a responsibility for what the companies do. Um, one just can't say, oh, uh, that's other people that are doing this. One has to take some responsibility. For the social scientists, I think this is a, a, a very exciting time because uh, AI, these new technologies, are changing our society. They may even be changing who we are as individuals. Uh, a lot of discussion about what they're doing to attention span, to, to spend our time. Uh, so, uh, profound effects on the way that individuals interact with each other. And of course, social science is about society, how we interact with each other. And so every aspect of the social science, how we as individuals, uh, market power, 
how we curb that market power, um, uh, the basic business model of the many of the the tech giants is about information, and it's information about individuals, and what we allow those corporations to do with that information, which is our information about ourselves, whether they can store it and use it for other purposes, is a matter of policy. And so the there are, what what is clear is that um, AI has opened up a whole new set of policy issues that we had not even begun to think about 20 years ago. You know, my Nobel Prize was in the economics of information. But when I did my work, I hadn't thought about the issue of disinformation and misinformation. We thought we had laws dealing with that called fraud laws and liable, liable, liable laws. We, we, and so that, that we, we just put it aside because we said, that's not a problem. Well, today it is a problem. And uh, so I just mentioned that because uh, what we're going to have to do is deal with a whole new set of problems that AI is presenting to our society. Thank you, thank Joe. You, Joe. And uh, thank you for this really inspiring call to action. And with that, let me just uh, invite everybody to give Joe a round of virtual applause and uh, have a good rest of the day.